Thanks, James. So um, another webinar session hosted by ourselves at Citizens Online. Uh, we're a charity operating in the UK. We help organisations ensure that the switch to digital doesn't exclude people. Uh, we've been operating uh, around the UK since 2000, uh, working in all kinds of communities from the Scottish Highlands and Islands down to the southwest of England, Northern Ireland and um, uh, deepest rural Wales. So we've, we've been around and all over. Um, I'm Managing Director and uh, James Beecher is Research Manager. James will be um, facilitating and hosting and keeping an eye on all the technicals as we go through. Uh, and I'll be trying to share some of our insights around this equalities impact assessment process that we've been through around digital exclusion with public health screening services. So uh, as I said, I'll, I'll introduce the equality impact assessment for Public Health England that we did. We'll talk about the process that we went through, uh, what we found in the course of that process and the recommendations that we, uh, that we came up with for the program. Um, and we'll have some time for discussion, questions and answers and a bit of sharing of resources. And as James said, um, you're very welcome to uh, throw into the chat what resources, if you've got hyperlinks and things that, that you also want to share, that's greatly appreciated. We always like to use these sessions to be able to harvest as much knowledge as we can, not just uh, preach from our perspective. We're going to do a quick uh, live poll to check uh, who's on the call um, and I'll let James introduce that. Yeah, so we just, it's helpful for us to have a bit of an idea of what our audience is today. So we've got some options here. Um, these aren't just for people who work in these sectors, but for people who volunteer in them or that's your interest, that's the reason you're here. So you might be here because you're involved in digital health. You might be involved in digital transformation or channel shift in a different area. You might work in digital inclusion like myself and Rich. You might work with people who have low or no digital skills or who are offline. Uh, digitally excluded people or you might just be interested so we'll give you a little bit longer to for people to keep voting and that might be everyone who can vote now so i just have 10 more seconds in case as there's, there's three people who haven't voted who might be able to they might be on a, on a phone call one more person has Okay, that's great. So I'll just end that and share these results with you. So interestingly, most of you on the call are either working with people who are digitally excluded or just interested. We don't have so many who are working in digital health. Um, we've got fewer people on this call than usual. So just 14 people who've managed to vote in the poll. Um, so about half of those are either just interested or working with people who have low or no digital skills. And we've got five people who are working in digital exclusion a few who are working on digital transformation and, and interestingly five who are working in digital health. So I hope you'll be able to share some insight with us and we can provide something useful to all of you that are on the call. Back to Rich. Thank you. So um, I'm going to say a little bit um, to set us up with a bit of context for this discussion. Um, and I'd like to just set out some top level things about about what we're going to talk about today. So first off, digital transformation and just to, uh, to just to name that for what it is, it's a uh, digital transformation is a process of systemic change. That's about both the systems, the digital, the technology and the people. It's about a whole system change about um, how organizations and services do the work that they do. Um, we also talk today about channel shift, which is a strategy or one strategy that can help achieve digital tra transformation, particularly channel shift in the context we talk about it today is about shifting from printed media, printed leaflets we'll talk a lot about, to online media, information online. So that's a shift of communication channel and we, we're going to talk a bit about that today. And an equalities impact assessment um, is a bit like what it says on the tin, um, but that's a goal, it's an output, it's part of the work that we do to try and make sure 
that a channel shift process goes well, doesn't marginalize people, exclude people, and that ultimately the way the work is eventually done um, doesn't, uh, doesn't disadvantage anybody. And of course, we're looking at this from a digital inclusion perspective. So Public Health England um, have got a program of uh, screen, screening programs. There's 11 of them all up. Um, you might be familiar with some, the bowel cancer screening program, cervical screening, breast screening, some of these things might be familiar. You may have uh, known people or been involved in them uh, yourselves. Um, those programs um, have huge populations of people in England that are eligible and those eligible people are sent invites by a letter usually and along with those letters comes a leaflet that tells you all about the program and those leaflets are super important because they are about giving people an informed choice about their health. And what Public Health England uh, were proposing to do and are proposing to do was reduce the number of uh, leaflets um, and increasingly support people to get that essential information online. And they asked us to take a, a look at the equality impact assessment um, about well, what's the impact of doing that? If we're encouraging more people to get essential info online, how does that impact different people around England? So there's a legal and ethical duty to assess those impacts. Um, there's the Equality Act and there's a public um, equality uh, duty um, to make sure that um, the populations aren't marginalised or disadvantaged in any way. So I'll just jump to the next slide. Um, this is just a, a brief overview. Uh, James, you might want to jump in on, on a couple of these things, but um, it sets out the uh, screening programs. Some of them are for um, antenatal and newborn services. So um, uh, pregnant people and um, new mothers uh, will, will have a series of, of population screening uh, offered. And there's others that I mentioned before. James, I'm not sure if you want to I think I'll come shortly on to what's what's significant about these is that they often target particular groups of people. So it's not that everyone is sent a letter about a screening program. People have sent these letters at a particular point in their life. So a particular group of people of a particular age will be sent letters. Um, obviously, for pregnancy, those are sent to you around something that's happened, you've become pregnant. But for bowel cancer screening, they're sent by age group. So every man and woman aged between 60 and 74 is sent a letter every two years, or for breast screening, every woman between 50 and 71 is routinely offered that screening. So I'll say a little about the, the research methodology. Um, I'll cover this in brief. Um, just to say this whole, whole process of equality impact assessment, um, we did this before COVID-19. We did it before um, uh, coronavirus hit. Um, and so the research was all based on insights and data uh, that happened before that program. It might be that uh, COVID-19 um, has changed the way you are running your services or the work that you're involved with. You might have to be engaging with people in a remote um, in a remote way, doing things digitally, doing more, more things online. And that might trigger the need for you to think about the equality's impacts of how you reach and engage with uh, the, the people that you, you, you're trying to work with. This is what we did to assess those impacts. We did a literature review. We looked at everything we could find around public health screening and digital transformation, channel shift, any data that was existing that could tell us anything about it. We reviewed public health's own performance data, looked at the trends in invites and how many people signed up and how many people were uh, getting the letters and receiving the letters and looking at the um, leaflets. We carried out a quite large online survey um, to get some opinions from the health sector. We undertook telephone interviews and focus groups, importantly with members of the public who attended those groups who were uh, engaging with the screening programs to find out um, their actual experiences and opinions of online data and the leaflets. 
we analyzed the whole lot we looked at which people weren't online and the kind of numbers of those within the different screening programs and then we did a whole process to score it risk um, um, a risk scoring process a weighting process so we tried to attach different kinds of importance to different kinds of data and then we ranked the uh, programs in a priority to say which ones we thought were most at risk and which groups were most at risk from the change. So I'll let James uh, say a little more about the, the results that we found. Yeah, this is our simplest way of presenting to you the results of that risk assessment and the, the, the weighted scores that each program got. So we found that the, the screening program where the risk was greatest was bowel cancer. That's particularly because of the age profile of the people who are being sent those um, those invitations. We also found that diabetic eye screening is, is very high and that's not just because of age, that's to do with other factors that are associated with people having diabetes, which means that they're the people who are being invited for screening. In particular, that's that um, diabetic eye, diabetes is, is higher among people who are living in more deprived areas and it's also associated with um, black and minority ethnic groups. So both of those things push it up in the risk ranking in terms of equality impact assessment. Other things that were included in this assessment, so a, a major factor and the thing that is weighted highest is the proportion and number of people associated with that screening program who we believe are offline, which is also a proxy for people who have lower digital skills. They tend to track each other quite well. So if there's a higher proportion of people who are offline, of those who are online, there'll be a, a higher number who, are, who would struggle to access the information or may not be in, inclined to do so even if they're using the internet for other things. Um, we also looked at how many leaflets were associated with each programme at the moment, um, what proportion of budgetary spend was going on each programme, which is different because some of those programmes have more than one leaflet associated with them. Um, and we looked at the results that we'd had from the focus groups and what we were told anecdotally about those programmes and how people interact with them. And we also looked at the current performance of those programmes. So if there was already a downward trajectory of take up, that was factored into the risk assessment. And if the take up was already low, that was factored into the assessment in terms of relative, relatively lower than the other programmes. We looked at each of the protected characteristics. So I'm not gonna tell you about the full analysis that we did for each of these, but I just wanted to mention them, hopefully for people who are not so familiar with um, Equalities Impact Assessment, this reminds you of what those, those characteristics are. And also gives those of you who are interested in digital inclusion, particularly a bit of insight into the kinds of things we talked about when we looked at those. So obviously we spend a lot of time talking about age when we talk about digital exclusion. We know that um, older people are less likely to be online, less likely to have a full range of essential digital skills. For instance, 29% of people who are aged 65 or older have never been online, um, according to the LNS data from last year. That might have shifted a bit with coronavirus, but we think it's still a really significant proportion. Equally, disabled people, around a fifth are not internet users compared to just 5% of people who are not disabled. That's for a variety of reasons, and um, often it's to do with the design of um, services that can exclude people and leave them to become, to, to, to become internet users, but then to become what we call lapsed internet users because they find it an unpleasant experience or a, an experience that's not useful to them. When we talk about um, sex, we know that there aren't that big differences if you look at the whole population between men and women. They're pretty much as likely to be online as each other but there is quite a significant difference in an, in an older age group. So it's sort of an intersection there between a protected characteristic around sex and the protected characteristic of age. Women who are over 65, around 63% of them are, are internet users compared to 71% of men. So it's not a, a huge difference, but there is a significant difference there. And obviously that's something we'd want to factor into assessment of screening programs that target women in particular. Similarly, with race, nationality, ethnic or national origin, there isn't a lot of evidence out there that these things are really significant in terms of who's online and who isn't. In fact, at the overall level, a smaller proportion of people who are black or from a minority ethnic background are offline compared to the white population. So 6.6% .6 compared to 
compared to 9%. But there are differences within that overarching group. So people with certain ethnic backgrounds are less likely to be online. And on the whole, that's associated or related to correlations with deprivation. So people who live in um, more deprived areas, that can be true of people who have certain ethnic backgrounds, and they then probably through that deprivation impact are less likely to be online. Religion or belief is a protected characteristic, and we know that there are some religious communities that have some kind of prohibitions around internet use or recommend not to use the internet. We concluded, having looked at this in a bit of detail, that that's unlikely to be significant in terms of their access to health information online, because usually those groups have caveats around you can use the internet for these really essential things. But nonetheless, we talked about that in more detail in the report. Being pregnant on long maternity leave is a protected characteristic, and obviously that's particularly important for one screening programme, the ANNV programme for antenatal and newborn. That's literally the people it affects. So if that screening programme was particularly affected by a channel shift, then that would be an equalities impact. But what we know is that those people are among the least likely to be digitally excluded off the screening programmes. That's not to say that everyone who's pregnant or has a new baby is online. There are people who will be offline but it's much lower than among the other groups. And we also know that when people are pregnant, they are receiving a lot of face-to-face -face appointments with their midwives, which again, reduces the potential impact of having information online. With regard to sexual orientation, there is again, very little evidence that there's any reason why people with a different sexual orientation would be less online or more online than anyone else. So for this section, we wrote more about how um, for some research from Stonewall, one in eight lesbian, gay or bisexual people have experienced some form of unequal treatment from healthcare staff because of their sexual orientation. So we just wanted to put in some information about how you might address that when communicating about screening programmes. Similarly, with regard to gender reassignment, there's not really any evidence that trans people are less likely to be online or more likely to be online. But there is some evidence, again, from Stonewall's survey that trans respondents found that their specific needs were often ignored or not taken into account by health services. So again, we signposted to some organisations that were providing recommendations about how to communicate to these people with regard to screening programmes, which PHE were already um, doing some work around. Finally, there are aspects which we looked into which are not protected characteristics, but are of also of importance when looking at the impact, equalities impact of channel shift around things like multiple deprivation. We know that people without any qualifications are much less likely to be internet users, just 36% of people who have no qualifications are regular internet users. But we also talked about other groups, people who are experiencing homelessness, um, other communities that might be less likely to be online and more affected by these proposals. What we did with that information is do some data analysis and produce some mapping. We mapped things by clinical commissioning group area. It's an NHS geography that's often about the same as a county council area, although it can be slightly different in some places. So on the left, you've got a map which is the adjusted rank of estimated offline population across all the target groups for the screening programmes. So we found that this tends to be more rural areas on the kind of periphery of England, North Norfolk, South Norfolk, Lincolnshire East, and some places on the south coast. But this varies quite a lot by specific screening program. So we produce maps like the one on the right for each screening program. The one on the right is for cervical cancer, and we found that the population associated with that screening program that's more likely to be offline is, tends to be um, in the southwest, and this obviously that extends beyond um, the southwest region into Cambridgeshire and Peterborough and to some urban areas like Birmingham and Solihull and Leeds as well. And in the, in the report, we produce estimates of the number of people in each of these CCG areas that we think are offline. What's important to say about that is we were looking at mapping the people who are offline and who therefore might be less likely to engage with information at some time. But we also took into account the data that already exists about people who are not taking up health screening. So this is an example of some information from Public Health England themselves. On the scale on the left, the percentage coverage, the upward axis, you've got how many people are taking up that um, screening programme. 
along the bottom, you've got the percentage of people in a CCG area who are black or from a minority ethnic group. And then there are two colors of dots. Um, for people who are aged 50 to 64, the orange dots, and you can see there's a slight downward trajectory to that line. So there's a slight impact that the higher the proportion of people in a CCG area who are black or from a minority ethnic group, the, the slightly lower coverage in terms of the cervical screening program. What's significant is that among people who are aged 25 to 49, the blue dots, that impact is much greater. So younger people who live in an area which is, has a higher proportion of black and minority ethnic groups, so the, the implication is that younger black people or younger people from a, a minority ethnic group are less likely to take up screening. And one thing that we might hope is that actually moving information online isn't likely to make them less likely to access that information and to conduct the screening. It might actually make them more likely to do so. Um, we'll talk about that in a lot more detail in the report. Really quickly, we did some survey work. This is um, the online survey where we had about 500 people respond. Obviously, it's worth saying that that excludes people who are offline, but it's not the only type of survey work that we did. We had some quite simple questions in here to begin with, things like, how happy do you feel about the proposals? Um, you can see here that that didn't tell us a great deal. We had a high number of responses in each section. Um, slightly fewer who said they were really unhappy, but this nonetheless is, is really an uh, uh, example of a chart that we couldn't really draw much from. All this chart tells us is that we need to look in more detail at the survey responses because it's not clear that people are either really happy about the um, proposals or that they're really unhappy. They have a mixed set of feelings about it. So people presented some positive things that they said, for instance, that it's much easier to update online information than it is to do a new print run of leaflets and obviously that's important because health information can change quite significantly. Um, someone pointed out that you might lose your leaflet and if the information is online as long as you know where to find it you can go back and, and get that information. On the other side of things someone mentioned that it's perhaps easier to share information with someone in your family or otherwise if you've got a leaflet you can just show it to them and point them to the things that you've looked at harder potentially to show them a, a website address. Someone else suggested that um, information that comes to people through email might get lost. People might be less likely to look at information that's, that's online given the huge amounts of that information that we, we get. I mentioned that we looked in the survey data in quite a lot more detail in order to draw out the nuances. One of the things we did is called set analysis. This is a bit like doing a scatter plot, but for words. So we coded the responses people had given, we looked at the words they'd used, and we divided the responses into the people who were neutral about the proposals, the people who were positive, the people who were negative about them overall with those simple questions. So this is the top five tags within people who were neutral. They talked about things like accessibility, they talked about having some concerns, they talked about the risk of exclusion, they talked about the need for choice, they wanted both ways of communicating people. And we looked at that and, and looked at different words that people used and how they were associated with each other. And what this helped us do is to identify interesting quotes, interesting things that we might want to look at. Um, we found interesting things like the fact that people mentioned one benefit of a paper leaflet is that as someone, a health professional, hands that leaflet over, they can potentially write extra notes on it from the conversation they've had with someone or um, the details of a, a follow-on appointment, that sort of thing. I'll hand back to Rich to talk about the recommendations that we ended up giving after doing this research. Thanks, James. So um, we, we ended up with 30 plus, 35 plus recommendations um, uh, from the whole analysis. And um, we grouped those into uh, different areas uh, and made some suggestions uh, and these were not just a public <coughs> excuse me public health um, screening team but this is about NHS delivery services that are actually running these programs as well so um, PHE are responsible for uh, the the information the, the the suitable information that people need to make the informed choice and making sure that's really high quality 
and then NHS services, commission services are responsible for actually doing the screening programme. So I'm not going to go through all of these areas, but I'm going to pick a couple of things out. Firstly, um, that top one, invitation letters. So um, we were acknowledging that at the moment a letter goes out with a leaflet. If you take the leaflet away, the information in the letter needs to be improved. It's got to be more concise, um, very, very easy to access and pretty much do the job um, of the leaflet on its own and a really good job of signposting um, someone to the online information and very um, uh, choiceful ways of getting there and, and finding the stuff you need. So we made recommendations about how PHE should uh, research and redesign what the best way to, to improve that invitation letter process would be to prepare for the removal of the leaflet accompanying it. We talked um, a lot about IT systems. So um, the invitation letter and the leaflet are only part of the process of getting that information out. There's a huge amount of IT in the background that's supporting you know, an understanding of the names and addresses, when people become eligible, how, how services know the particular demographic information or, or important information about those invites. And some of the feedback we received was that the IT systems really needed to be improved to help services reach the public in a, in a really effective way. So IT system improvements, things like um, getting better uh, information, all under GDPR compliance, of course, but around the particular needs of people. Can we get the IT systems to understand um, someone's phone number and store it, whether someone has a learning difficulty or disability that affects how they need to understand things, um, whether they have particular uh, sight loss, visual impairment, um, that also means that a letter landing on the doorstep isn't going to be a useful thing. So IT systems was a big area and we also talked about text messaging as a specific communication channel. Uh, we found examples of where text messaging to communicate with the public had, had worked really well and had actually increased um, uh, access to the screening program in a localised area. Uh, but there was a lot of difference about how text messaging services had been used. Not all of it had gone uh, perfectly. So we made some recommendations about further um, exploration to improving and, and getting a, a, a better sort of service for everybody through text messaging that can point people to online. Because for a lot of people, that's a really effective way to get information. A text message with a little bit of info, with a hyperlink that you can click, that takes you straight to the information on the website and you've got it there. And that really works for a lot of people. The other areas um, I'll, I'll pick out, we talked about um, budget, broadly speaking, with an understanding that these programs are of hugely differing sizes. Uh, the, the eligible populations for the AAA screening program, for example, um, uh, compared to the eligible population for uh, diabetic eye screening or um, bowel cancer screening, they're hugely different. And the budgets, therefore, around how many leaflets do we need to print are affected by that greatly. Um, so we made some um, um, recommendations around looking at where the risks lie with offline populations in those programmes and how, um, how services might want to think about how many leaflets might we need in the future for this particular programme? And we looked at it that way. We also gave three broad principles about how the recommendations should be taken forward. Very simply put, first one is take a phased approach. Don't do everything all at once. Um, there are risks involved in changing the information delivery system. So start with the lowest risk first. The second one, is uh, retain some printing capacity um, and ensure that you don't just switch off leaflets entirely. Um, got to understand that some people will still need them, which links to the third principle, um, which is for the user, for the member of the public, maintain choice and meet their needs. Um, while digital might be the first offer for information, 
um, and it might be suitable and the best thing for the vast majority of folks um, there will be people who need face-to-face -face contact who need a telephone call or who need the printed media and that might be um, just what they need so you've got to make sure that you can maintain that choice for people in the program thanks rich so we'll i'll stop sharing the screen shortly and we'll go to q a i'll just give one last reminder that if you don't want your face to be on the video recording then we want to stop sharing your video now so if i stop sharing and i start to have a look at the chat and see if we've got any questions i can mainly see that we've had introductions so far so i think um we've got one question from phil so phil i'll unmute you hello hi phil morning how are you all right well thanks what's your question it's all about um when you're getting text messages and phone calls um one of the barriers for people right now is that most people have got the technology of call blocking so if there isn't an actual number stored in your contact list, the call or the text won't actually get through. So I was just wondering if there was any analysis done about how the software is actually prohibiting people from getting the information they need because of the safety features that we're trying to build in. It's a great question, Phil. Uh, it's not um, something that I know much about. Rich, I don't know whether you remember anything that we said about this. No, I'm, I'm going to say that um, in terms of the analysis for that, I, the, the, the things that we saw, there was quite a big piece of work. Um, James, you might be able to remind me, but there was a, a big piece of research about text messaging that we looked at in the, in the, in the report. Um, however, I'm not sure it, it entirely covered that specific issue that you're flagging, Phil, about um, numbers being blocked. Um, and and how you get around that um we did build into the research and it's it's there we've got this available online but there was a series of recommendations that came out of the research about how to uh, design um text messaging communication systems um, and we put those into the recommendations it was quite broad ranging um but it was certainly thinking about uh, user need and accessibility uh, in terms of designing a, a text messaging system in the first place and certainly avoiding the, um, you know, these very quick win things that sometimes get set up. And, and those are the examples we, we, we saw that didn't go so well. I, I think your question points to a, a broad issue um, that is important for all digital inclusion and skills work at the moment, um, which is where, um, fear, lack of trust, um, security, data privacy. Um, these concerns are all at the forefront of the public agenda at the moment. And um, it's one of the greatest reasons that holds people back from um, getting involved with anything online. Um, and while people might get by with um, Facebook interactions or uh, skyping a relative or using whatsapp when it comes to health information or financial transactions or giving very personal data anything that's kind of in that realm of of personal and sensitive that barrier becomes bigger so i think you're absolutely right to <laughs> to question it you know what's going on about that um, because the public have got some real concerns um around data privacy I yes. wonder. Looking at looking at the report, Phil, the line that we the line that I can find that we put in is that uh, we put NHS screening services should introduce text messaging as a cost effective way to target messages to the public. However, text can only be sent when phone numbers are available and people have consented to be contacted in this way. So I think the solution is that the surgery says to people, you're only going to receive this text if you put our number in your phone. Um, which can happen as part of that consent process of saying are you happy for us to contact you by by text message um, some other things that are worth saying here are that um, the research suggests that people with smartphones are more likely to follow a web link in a text message than someone is to follow a web link that they receive in a letter which is perhaps unsurprising because it's very easy to do you press the button and you're taken to the site 
with a letter, you might have to turn on the device, open a browser, type in the, the address and so on. And you might just get the letter and decide you're going to do that later and then not remember to. But there is an issue with that, which is that people using a smartphone might be more reluctant to access the link if they think it's an unsafe link, if they can't be absolutely sure that the text has come from a verified place. And we know that there are texts going around at the moment. For instance, when the government sent out a text, we know it was accompanied by other people sending out texts pretending to be from the government. Um, in a letter, people are more likely to trust that the information is from where it's come from. You can have the branding on the letter. People generally feel that letters are a more sort of authoritative form of communication, that it's less likely someone would be going to the effort of sending a letter as part of a scam. We obviously do know that does happen on occasions as well, but people generally feel that letters are, are more trustworthy. So I think it, you know, there's, there's lots of difficulty there, but there are options and, and that's why we talked about following best practice examples really, because there are, there are places that have thought about that stuff and done it well. And as Rich said, where it has ended up increasing take up of, of some of the screening programs. Okay, Do we have any other questions? I'm going to look in the chat again. Miriam, shall I unmute you? You might have to do it yourself, Miriam. It doesn't seem to have worked. So, okay, better. yeah, yeah, there you go. Is that all right? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we, uh, uh, we, we, we're doing a survey of our uh, local residents who have contacted us uh, for COVID support, you know, through the, uh, there's uh, 1500 plus local residents that we're working with. And um, we're doing a survey to see about their, their relationship to whether they're online and how they feel about it. Because quite most of our services probably, we need to be looking at some kind of digital content to enable us to continue because it's too risky particularly because there's so many older and disabled people use our building, we're too risky for them to come with the COVID stuff going on. So we've turned ourselves inside out. And so we need to look at a way to deliver meaningful activities in the community for those people. And we're exploring what scope there is for a digital element to that. So that's the sort of context where my question comes from. So the, the what, I was wondering was have you looked at uh, the training learning and you know culture shifts that that are required you know did you look at that and what recommendations or what you learn from looking at that and and what kind of machines or technology um would you use for example you know with a laptop you can do distance um what's the word you know you can get somebody else from somewhere else can come on your computer and set up an app for example and yeah. set the controls at the right level for people with visual or or or, or oral um our, our oral um, disabilities so they can hear and engage with technology and access levels things like that so that that's what i was wondering yeah so this is um, the, the sorts of things that we would say um, when we work with any organisation. We did say some of this to Public Health England, but it's, it applies more broadly. And it's the sort of stuff that's covered in some of our previous webinars, Miriam. So you might be able to um, get some of the information from those. What we tend to recommend is, or, or say is that digital inclusion is a problem that can't be solved by a single organisation. It's like a systemic problem. There's a lot of people who lack digital skills or who aren't online. They they might interact with an organization very briefly when a problem occurs to them, they can't access the resource, but they're probably interacting with a range of other organizations who might be able to support them. So what we try to do when we're working in a local area, usually we're contracted by a local authority. We try to set up a digital inclusion network where a whole range of public sector, private sector and third sector organizations are talking to each other. And that one of the things they can do is set up some sort of system of triage and referral between themselves so they can identify people who have a digital skills need and refer them to someone who can help which sounds a bit like what you're a part of what you're trying to do you're doing a bit of that triage process of surveying them yeah. um, then what we suggest is that people train people to become what we call digital champions so they might be volunteers who are offering to help people with digital skills they might be paid might be recruited solely to do that job 
or they might be what we call embedded digital champions. So that's people who work for customer services at a council or work in the housing associations, customer facing um, departments. And we would try and train those people up so that they can help people. And the way that we tend to do that is to signpost them to a partner organization called Digital Unite, who have a platform called the Digital Champions Network, which is lots of resources, um, lesson plans, individual guides about particular things, devices, particular devices, particular pieces of software and so on. So that those people can become able to help others. And we really like to emphasize at that point that to be a digital champion, you don't have to be an IT whiz. In fact, in some ways, those people are the last people that you want to be yes. providing help. What you really True. need is people who are good at um, empathizing yes. with people, good at being yes. patient, good at exploring the answers to a question that they themselves don't immediately know the answer to, but they mm. can help that person to understand where they can find an answer and together they can find yeah. a solution. Yeah. Um, in non-COVID times, we often signpost people to libraries where there is, there's usually some sort of digital volunteer system set up. Obviously, at the moment, that's not really possible. Libraries are closed and it's a real problem because that's where a lot of people were going to, not just for help, but for actual access yeah. to a device yeah. or the internet. Um, but there usually is something happening in an area. Um, so. Uh, obviously, I live in the same area as you, Miriam, so I should be able to tell you, I'd like to be able to tell you more. Um, I know that Gloucestershire County Council at the moment have some money out going to organisations that are hopefully going to be doing digital inclusion projects. So that's, so there should be some, some organisations around that you could get in touch with and we can talk about that privately. Yeah, thank you. Rich, did you want to say any more? Yeah, just that there's a, there is a host of um, free online and downloadable resources to help both digital champions, the, 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 uh, the intermediaries, and members of the public. Um, uh, and they're all pitched at various different levels, um, but there are, there are lots of free uh, resources out there. Um, as an online learning resource, Learn My Way, which is run by Good Things Foundation. Um, uh, James mentioned Digital Unite's um, Digital Champions Network, but Digital Unite also have a host of free um, downloadable resources in, in Word document um, format or um, PDF format that can help uh, help those conversations happen and just help people who want to know, you know, how do I how do I set an email up? Mm -hmm. Very very simple stuff like that. Um, so there's a lot of free stuff out there um and yeah i i would you you sort of asked about the technology itself you know what do you, what do you what do you put in i think the important thing is to say um uh don't arrive at a point where you come up with a, a one size fits all answer you know it's it's having solution technical solutions that are that are built around different user needs is is just essential um so i think it would be remiss of us to say uh, for example yeah these types of tablets are the best thing there's the, there's things that we use but we would say if we're going to try and help remove the barriers to being online you've really got to have a mixed um a mixed system to help support it so when it comes to the tech having desktop computers available that people can use, having laptops available on loan, having tablets available, having smartphones that people can try out, the ability for people to use their own equipment, I would say put at number one. Most folks do actually have their own equipment now, um, um, but they may not know how to use it. and <laughs> They may need help yeah. and support around how to use yes. their own equipment. Yes. Um, yeah. And then when it comes to the support that's in place, um, that's around a blended approach. So yeah, it's not, we're not gonna fix the problems by just having an army of volunteers, um, you know, either available on the phones or setting up in community halls or in libraries. It's got to include um, uh, the employees, the workers, the different kind of sectors, uh, including, you know, those that might be able to access a, a more commercial service. I don't know, it's, some people will have a, a, an Apple center near them with, with whizzy people there who can help out with their equipment so again 
COVID-19, uh, you know, permitting and everything we've got going on, but it's about having uh, a, not a one size fits all approach. We've got to support all parts of the system to help people get online. Thanks. Thanks. Good. I'm glad that's helpful, Miriam. I think we're going to have to start wrapping up. So before we, we finish, um, Bob, would you like to just say a little bit more about the, the Bob, Bob was on our session last week and talked about health inequalities, but Bob also did some work with us on the, the Public Health England report that we did, um, particularly around the focus groups. And you wanted to share some other insight from those, Bob. Yeah, just a couple of uh, quick things, James, really. Um, so I'm a, I'm a digital inclusion consultant. I work with uh, a number of um, organizations in uh, the NHS and, and in the voluntary sector. Uh, first time I've worked with Citizens Online. And I just wanted to say that I was so impressed by the quality of the work around this, this particular um, report and particularly the way in which Citizens Online were use, uh, able to use a range of methods from um, quantitative data mapping right across to um, some of the uh, qualitative insights through interviews and, and, and um, focus groups. So great piece of work and, and I'm proud to have been part of it. I just wanted to share two things which I thought were really interesting uh, from the focus groups that I did. And I think they show how our understanding of digital exclusion needs to be particularly nuanced it's not just a binary thing around people being online or people being offline. And two things really struck me when I did a, a focus group with some um, bowel screening patients. So these are all people between 65 and 75. They had uh, a bowel cancer test in the post and there were some concerns about the results and they had to go to hospital to have some tests in hospital. Didn't mean they had bowel cancer, but they were kind of a little bit more in the system. Um, every single one of that focus group said they were online. When I explored it a little more, all of them were online for a very niche purpose. They were online to do just online shopping. They were online just to have a video call with their relatives. They were online in one case just to do painting by numbers. I didn't even know you could do that online. None of them said they would be keen to access health information online. So our assumption that the problem is whether people are online or not is not that binary. It's a much more nuanced thing about what people are prepared to do when they're online. Second thing I thought was fascinating was another kind of nuanced thing. It's not a simple and or thing around digital information and print information. In a focus group, people said they might be prepared to access screening information online, but they would always want to print it off. And very few had a printer in their home. So two things there, people are gonna to need to go somewhere to get to a printer. And most of them were using the library. And as you say, James, at the moment, uh, libraries are closed. So there's a, there's, a, there's a problem there. And secondly, we're not really achieving channel shift and digital transformation if people are simply accessing the information online and then printing it off. All we've done really is shift the cost and burden of print costs from Public Health England to the citizen. So it's not really transformation. So I think just, just a comment there about nuance. I hope that's sort of interesting to people and yeah, that comes through in the report. That's brilliant, Bob, thank you. And, and like you say, we, we always try to emphasize that um, digital inclusion isn't a binary thing. It's very much not about the, the problem being solved once people are online. Even people who are, I mean, we talk about what Bob is um, describing there as narrow users, people who have who are online but use it for a very specific purpose or a very specific set of purposes and aren't comfortable or confident going beyond those things that they perhaps learn how to do through the help of someone or is the one thing that they feel very motivated to do online. Um, we talk about them as narrow users, we talk about um, how even people who are confident, even people who are well, 
take myself, even people who've been online for more than half their lives, who doesn't really feel scared when I come across anything, there are still lots of things I can't do and lots of things that I'll encounter that are new. And that's, that's going to be the case for most people. Um, everyone at some point is going to need a bit of help to do something new. That's one thing that we try to emphasize. We're out of time, so I'm going to switch over to just the resources for the next bit. And I think some of these will help answer some of the questions that came up then. So let me start the presentation again. Hopefully you can all see this. If someone can give me a thumbs up, that would be helpful. Yeah, so first off, you can access the full report, which is quite large, or the summary report that we wrote for Public Health England. It's publicly available on our website. And you can also look at the individual appendices. You can download them separately. So for instance, if you're interested in digital exclusion in health at the moment, you might want to have a look at the literature review rather than the specific report for Public Health England around screening programmes. Um, you might be interested in the survey aspect particularly and so on. So you can look at those different appendices if you'd like to. Um, is that going to need to pass on or is it going to take me to one of the websites? It's going to be the same. Good. One of the things we've done that's relevant to this is we've created a, a map which we hope is useful for people to help them understand digital exclusion with relevance to health in England. Uh, pub, uh, NHS England produce data around GP surgeries in England and that's information about the population at each GP surgery, which we represented in the size of these circles on the map. The age profile of each surgery, which is represented by the colour on the map. Purple is an age profile that's older, which we would, might assume would be more likely to be offline or we know is more likely to be at risk from the virus if someone catches it. And then we've circled these either with a pink circle or a blue circle. At the moment, only the pink circles are available. You can turn these on and off on the map. Um, to highlight surgeries where fewer than 30% of the patients have registered for an online service or for the blue circle, those where it's more than 30%. Um, NHS England has a target of 20%, but some surgeries have gone way beyond that even before COVID. Um, the data at the moment is for April and um, for March and April. It was initially for February. We're in the process of doing some analysis about how that's changed recently. And it's worth saying there's some caveats around it in terms of the fact that people can be registered through a third party source and it won't be picked up on this data. But um, if people have registered for online appointment booking, prescriptions, or to access their health records online, then that shows up in this data. And it's quite interesting to see how things vary where you are. Uh, last week we talked about health inequalities more broadly and I mentioned these three reports which might be of interest to people. Um, the government's COVID-19 review of disparities and risks in outcomes produced by Public Health England talking about how people have been more likely to catch or die of the disease um, of the virus recently. The New Economics Foundation together with Migrants Organising Medac produced a report specifically about migrants access and the impacts on them. And the Royal College of Physicians produced a report looking at how to mitigate the impact of health inequalities during COVID-19, which is where you get this little Venn diagram from about how um, different aspects of uh, health inequalities and how they overlap with um, equality impact assessment. We mentioned Digital Unite, our partners. They've got three things available at the moment, lots of free guides and resources, specifically pulling out the ones that might be relevant now, health information and so on. They've got top tips for people who are providing virtual or remote digital champion support, how to do that safely. And Miriam, you mentioned that idea of um, remote control, someone being able to take control of the device. We've done a session on that previously, um, which you can find on our um, events page. And finally, they've got free digital champion training through the Digital Champions Network. Um, something specific to mention about Digital Unite is they've, they've launched a digital health champions network. We mentioned earlier that um, we think that staff within organisations need to be trained to be digital champions. What we often find is that staff in organisations themselves lack the digital skills to be able to use the digital services they're supposed to be encouraging others, their patients or their other clients to be using. So the Digital Champions, Digital Health Champions Network is something from Digital Unite specifically helping people who work in health to help others to get online or improve their digital skills or to use um, digital systems. It's a CPD accredited course, as lots of them on Digital Unite are. It comes with 
dedicated resources, other training tools, lots of additional online learning on helping people who are um, going to be in, interacting with health services but who have specific needs, whether they're older or have accessibility issues. There's specific information there about overcoming people's barriers to managing their health online. That might be things to do with privacy and security. It might be to do with how to use the internet safely. And there's lots of information about the basic skills that people need and specific apps that they might be encountering, like the NHS app and so on. Um, we have a page on our website for a range of resources we think are useful at the moment around coronavirus. And as of today, that includes a section around digital health, which signposts to some of those key Digital Unite resources, such as how to use the NHS app and NHS websites, as well as a couple of resources that Rich mentioned from Learn My Way, which is more designed for an individual person who wants to um, teach themselves how to use the internet to get ready for coronavirus or how to explore the NHS website. The Digital Unite resources are more designed for people who are going to be acting as a digital champion, although not exclusively, they could be accessed by anyone. We're going to take a week off next week. Usually at this point I'm telling you what we're going to do next week. I'm going to have a break next week, I'm on annual leave. So we'll, we'll have a week off, but if you want to find out about our future events, we, we will be coming back, I think. So go to citizensonline.org.uk forward slash events and you'll find recordings of all our previous sessions and details of how you can register for upcoming sessions when we, when we get those planned. So thanks for being on the call with us. Uh, that's everything. If you would like to get in touch, if you've got any questions that have occurred to you um, only after we stopped that section or you didn't have time for them, do feel free to email us. You'll get both our email addresses with an email I'll send around um, shortly with all the slides, a link to the recording of the session and a few of the key resources linked in it as well.